No, that's true. All right, here we go. Hebrews chapter 6 tonight. We studied last week on the seven baptisms. And, uh, and now we're coming up to the part where, boy, everybody breaks their neck. Now, this, listen, you've got to be careful in three books. I know I've said this a million times, but I'll say it a million and one more times. There's three books you've got to be careful in. You've got to be careful in the book of Matthew. You've got to be careful in the book of Acts. And you've got to be careful in the book of Hebrews. When somebody says, Brother Sluter, I'm going to show you something that may, that's contrary to church age doctrine, I can almost guarantee they're going to take me to Acts, Matthew, or Hebrews. It's just, it's a given. All right? So Hebrews chapter number one, we studied that last week about going on into perfection and all that and the doctrines of baptisms and repentance uh, from dead works and faith toward God and the laying on of hands, verse 2, and baptism, verse 2, and of the resurrection of the dead. We could also study there. Won't take time to do it, but we could talk about the seven resurrections. There's the resurrection of Christ. There's the resurrection of the Old Testament saints. There's the resurrection of the church age saints. There's the resurrection of the tribulation saints. There's the resurrection of the millennial saints. And there's the resurrection of all the dead, the lost dead. Is that seven? Six. Is that six? Which one am I missing? Oh, there's the resurrection of the two witnesses in Revelation. There it is. All right, so we could talk about all those resurrections and all that, um, and 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 that, but we won't take time to do that this evening. That's pretty straightforward. The seven resurrections and all that, <clears throat> but now we look at verse number three, and this will we do if God permit. We're going to leave all this stuff. We're going to go on study better things. You know, we're leaving the principles of the doctrines of Christ, and we're going on into perfection. We're growing. We're not staying with the milk. We're not staying with the milky things, the light things. Well, uh, how to have a better marriage and how to have a better prayer life and how to have a better soul winning program. All those are great things. Don't get me wrong. Prayer and faith and soul winning and, 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 and all that and having better relationships at home, all that's very important. Please don't get me wrong. But what I'm talking about is, is there's more in the Bible than just John 3, 16, give, give some money, tell people about Jesus and, and live good life. There's more in the Bible than that. And, and we've seen that so far, right? So this will we do if God permit. Verse number four. Now watch this. This is where everybody gets confused. I would say one of the most common heresies taught in churches today is the doctrine that you can lose your salvation. Right. The doctrine of once saved, always saved, is one of the most hated doctrines by people that don't believe it. In fact, Jimmy Swagger, I always love using Jimmy Swagger as an example, <laughs> because Jimmy Swagger used to say that, that eternal security, he called it that most damnable heresy, is what Jimmy Swagger called it. Well, when Jimmy Swagger got caught in a room full of prostitutes, it didn't seem like he got in. All of a sudden, he believed in eternal security, or maybe room full of prostitutes wasn't bad enough to lose your salvation over <laughs> <laughs> right? Yeah. You say, you say, preacher, I know I ain't nobody comes here. <laughs> well, it's because I just tell the truth about it, right? Yeah. Well, you know, people say, well, I believe you can lose your, I believe you can lose your salvation. And say, well, I don't believe you can lose your salvation. Well, we'll just agree to disagree. It's not a big deal. No, it's a big deal. Whether you can be saved and then lost, that's a big deal. We, we better figure out if the Bible teaches that a man can lose his salvation. Now, I'm going to show you right here where all the confusion is. We're not going to go to the Greek. We're not going to try to twist the verses. We're not going to try to make it seem what they're going to make it seem to say what. Listen, we believe the Bible regardless of how we feel about it, right? Right. We don't change it to fit our agendas. We don't change it to fit our own prerogatives. I believe in once saved, always saved. Amen. I believe in eternal security. But I don't change Scripture just because I believe that. If I can't find... Hey, listen, if a verse says something contrary to what I believe, I've either believed something wrong or I'm reading somebody else's mail. Does that make sense? Uh -huh. For example, I don't have to cut off my hands and my feet and pluck out my eyeballs to get into the kingdom of heaven. But there's a group in Matthew 5 in the millennial kingdom. That's what they'll have to do. Yep. See? I don't believe that I have to do that, so I must be reading somebody else's mail. 
Same with the book of Hebrews. So now let's look at Hebrews chapter 6, verse number 4. For it is impossible for those who were once enlightened. That word enlightened, that's a salvation term. You read the Apostle Paul, he talks about being enlightened. He talks about in the book of Psalms 119, it says that thy word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. The Bible says in Psalm 19 that the, word, the law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. I think it's another part in there, enlightening the eyes. Am I getting that right, Psalm 19? I think, yeah. Huh? What does it say there in Psalm 19? Somebody look up Psalm 19. I think it's the law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. The law, something, the law of the Lord is good or something, enlightening the eyes. Somebody look that up for me. Well, yeah, I th- I'm pretty sure it's enlightening the eyes. The, of the, the law of the Lord is perfect. Hang on, hang on, hang on. Dan, you got it? Yeah. The statutes of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. The commandment of the Lord is pure. There it is. Right. Enlightening the eyes. See that there? So this thing about enlightenment, the, the, the enlightenment is when the lights come on. You go from darkness to what? Light. light. That's a salvation experience. Okay? So this person in Hebrews 6 is somebody that's been enlightened. Then notice now, and have tasted of the heavenly gift. Now, the heavenly gift is what? Salvation. Has to be salvation. There are only two things in the Bible that are talked about as gifts. That is salvation. It is the gift of God and the Spirit of God. It's called the gift of the Holy Ghost, right? Now, of course, if you don't have the Holy Ghost, then you're not saved. So they're one and the same. You can't have salvation without the Spirit, and you can't have the Spirit without salvation. See that thing there? So that's the gift. So they've ta- they, have, they have tasted of the heavenly gift. Now, here's what they'll say. They've tasted of the heavenly gift. Here's what people will say. Well, they tasted, but they never swallowed. So I've, heard, I've heard preachers say that. They tasted, but they never swallowed. They just had a taste of it but they never really got true salvation. A lot of Calvinists will use these verses. Well, because there's, if this is not talking about a man losing his salvation, then what are the other explanations? It has to be somebody that never truly got saved. So people say, well, this isn't talking about people that lose their salvation. This is talking about people that never truly got saved, and they didn't really eat of salvation. They just kind of tasted it. Well, hold on a second. Doesn't Hebrews chapter 2 say that Jesus tasted death for every man? Well, he didn't really taste death. He didn't really swallow death. He just tasted it. See how the, the logic falls apart there? These people tasted of the heavenly gift. Notice what else it says. And were made partakers of the Holy Ghost. I was sitting down beside a guy. And I, I, I may use the board. I had my marker open like I was going to write something. I don't think I am, though. I, this is my hand to God. I was sitting beside a guy. And he claimed to be, and I think he probably was, very King James only. King James only to the core. He didn't even like the Greek. Now, he wouldn't call himself a Ruckmanite, but he had some of Dr. Ruckman's, hated Dr. Ruckman's stance on divorce and remarriage, but had some of Dr. Ruckman's books underneath his shelf. You know how that thing goes. And um, and so I, I asked him one time, I said, I was asking about these verses back when I first got a hold of dispensationalism. And I asked about these verses, and I said, this verse is talking about a man losing his salvation. It has to be. I said, look, it says they were made partakers of the Holy Ghost. A lost person isn't made a partaker of the Holy Ghost. This is what his reply was. His reply was, well, and now this is a King James guy, a guy that I had never heard go to the Greek before in my life, and I heard him preach several times. He said, well, that Greek word there, partaker, it just kind of means to go along with, to kind of just... To like go like to like to travel along with, wow. just to go along with, and I sit there thinking, that's the dumbest thing I've ever heard in my life. <laughs> I asked another guy. I asked another guy. This was a King James guy. I mean, King James is the core. I asked him the same thing. You know what he did? He did the exact. He said, "Well, that Greek word partaker there. If you study it back, it kind of has the idea of just going along with." I sit there thinking, going along with it. They said, yeah, you know, people that kind of act like they got saved, but they never really got saved. Okay. Dumb, man. You know what the Bible says in Hebrews chapter 3? It says we are made partakers of Christ. When you get saved, you are made a partaker. In fact, Paul says, and over there in 1 Timothy 6, partakers of the benefit. 
The word partakers has the idea that you partook in something. You are a part of it. You are made partakers of the Holy Ghost. When you get saved, the Holy Ghost indwells you. You are put into the body of Christ and all that kind of stuff, right? Now, we understand that during the tribulation period, things don't work exactly the same as far as as the Holy Spirit goes. But in the tribulation period, they still get the Holy Ghost when they get saved. They're made partakers of the Holy Ghost. Notice, and have tasted the good word of God. They tasted the good word of God. Remember over there where it talks about in, uh, in the sower and the seed? Sower went out to sow and he throws out that seed. And the Bible says the seed is the what? Word. The word of God, right? It's the word of God. And those so listen, all, there are three out of the four souls that accept the word of God, right? The only, the, only, the only ground that doesn't receive it is the ground that that was hardened and the devil comes and plucks it out of their heart, right? But all the other ones, the seed goes in there and germinates and, and brings plants up. Because that parable is not talking about salvation. That parable is talking about what? Fruit bearing. We won't take time to get into all that. But now notice, we'll get to that probably next week. But we might get to it this week because it ties into verse 7. But notice, these are made partakers of the Holy Ghost and tasted the good word of God and the powers of the world to come. Now notice, all that's a parenthetical phrase, quote-unquote. It's, 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 it's commas. Notice it says in verse 6, if they shall fall away to renew them again into repentance. Notice, if you take this phrase, that's a long phrase, verse 4 or 5, but it leads to verse 6. Notice if we leave out those, those adjectives, for it is impossible for those who are once enlightened, if they shall fall away, to renew them again into repentance. See that there? Now, I'm not subtracting from Scripture. I'm just trying to show you grammatically how that's reading. You've got a lot of, lot of things, descriptors there. It is impossible for those who enlightened, tasted, been partakers, Taste of the good word of God, power of the world to come. It's impossible if they shall fall away to renew them again into repentance. So, here's what people will say. Well, it's saying that if they fall away, it's impossible to renew them again into repentance. But we know it's impossible to fall away, so this is just like a hypothetical. Really. Oliver B. Green says this is describing the judgment seat of Christ. A lot of writers say that this is people who never truly got saved. They just kind of made a false profession, just kind of acted like they got saved. Folks, the fact of the matter is, this is people that are getting saved. When somebody, when somebody comes to me and says, and, says uh, and I meet them or whatever, they're talking to me, and they say, well, you know, these verses here in Hebrews 6, they're talking about a man losing their salvation. I say, you're absolutely right, it is. Now, here's what's funny. Here's what's funny. I had a guy, I won't say his name, I don't know if he still listens to my stuff, but I won't say his name, he was a Pentecostal guy. And Pentecostals teach, like almost every other denomination, barring the Presbyterians, they teach that a man can lose his salvation. Baptists specifically, Baptists and Presbyterians, teach that a man cannot lose their salvation. Specifically independent Baptists, okay? you got your free will Baptists that do teach the man can lose salvation. But I had this Pentecostal guy, and he came up, and we were talking, and, and he was saying, yeah, I believe a man can lose his salvation. He said, and I believe... I said, well, let me ask you a question. Have you ever lost your salvation? And he kind of hem-hauled around, and he said, well, uh, you know what? I, I, I believe that when I was a teenager, I got away from God. And I said, but I asked you, did you lose your salvation? He hem-hauled around. He said, well, um... Uh, well, I, I believe that, that if I died, I would have probably not gone to heaven. I said, I said, man, would you answer my question? Did you lose your salvation? Well, I, 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 I don't think I would have gone to heaven. And I said, so you believe you'd have gone to hell? Uh, yeah, so you lost your salvation? Yes. He admitted it to me. I said, all right, well, did you get rebaptized? No. Did you rejoin the church? No. Did you did you did you you know did you get recalled to preach? No. See that how that thing goes there. But then I said, well, hold on a second. Barring all that, let me ask you a question. I took him to Hebrews six. I said Hebrews six says that if a man loses his salvation, it's impossible for him to get it back. And he read the verses and he turned white in the face. 
I said, so you either lost it and never got it back, and you're lost now, and you're doomed and damned for hell, and nothing you can do about it, because the Bible says it's impossible to renew you again in repentance. Either that, or, number two, you just never were saved at all, and you're just still lost, or number three, you're still saved. That's the only three options. If somebody believes you can lose your salvation, and they think they've lost it, then by the, the Word of God clearly teaches that once you lose it, you can't ever get it back. It's impossible to renew you again into repentance. All right. Look at Second Peter chapter two. Look at Second Peter chapter two. Look at Second Peter chapter two. All right. Look there at verse number um, nineteen. Verse number nineteen. Second Peter chapter two. Verse number nineteen. Notice what it says. While they promise them liberty, they themselves are the servants of corruption. For of whom a man is overcome, of the same is he brought in bondage. For if, after they have escaped the pollutions of the world through the knowledge of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. So notice, these are people that escaped the pollutions of the world through the knowledge of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. These are saved people, right? There's no way that lost people can be put in this description, but somehow these people will do it. They'll try to say, well, that's not really talking about people losing their salvation. That's talking about lost people that, like, clean their lives up. See, you got to start saying weird, stupid things to, when you start trying to believe that kind of stuff. They've escaped the pollutions of the world through the knowledge of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. If they are, no, notice it says, for if after they've escaped, the pollutions, if they are entangled again therein and overcome, the latter end is worse with them than the beginning. That means to be escaped from that and then to go back again and get entangled in it, you're worse off the second time than you were the first time. For it had been better for them not to have known the way of righteousness than after they have known it to turn from the holy commandment delivered unto them. But it has happened unto them, according to the true proverb, the dog is return, excuse me, the dog is turned to his own vomit again, and the sow that was washed to her wallowing in the mire. A man losing his salvation. Clear as day, plain as day. For all these Baptists to go around and say a man can't lose his salvation and then for these verses and say, well, these verses apply to the church. These verses apply to me and you. Those people out there, they know what the... Listen, do you know that a Pentecostal has more biblical sense than a Baptist that doesn't believe these verses? That's the truth. A Pentecostal has more sense than these independent Baptists that deny dispensationalism. Why? Because these verses clearly teach a man can lose his salvation. Here's the kicker. Once they lose it, though, they can't ever get it back. <laughs> how many? How many of these? How many of you? How many of you know somebody that believes you can lose your salvation? I, I know some. How many of you have ever heard them talk about the fact that once you lose it, you can't ever get it back? Never. One person I've heard talk about it. And he, was, and he said that the only way you can lose your salvation is by like completely rejecting God and making a decision not to be a Christian anymore. Like basically like denying God and becoming an atheist. And he, and he actually said when that happens, you no longer can get saved again. Okay. But see, these verses are talking about a lifestyle. It's not talking about just becoming an atheist. These are talking about a lifestyle. Well, let me ask you a question, folks. These people that believe you can lose it but can't ever get it back, or believe that you can lose it but then they get saved, lost, saved, lost, saved, lost, saved, lost, that's not the Bible. We believe, listen, here's what we believe. We believe from these verses that if a man loses his salvation, he can't ever get it back. That's what we believe. The caveat is, is we don't believe in this dispensation a man can lose his salvation. Right. See, if I could lose my salvation, I couldn't get it back. 
the, the reality is, though, I can't lose it because I'm in the dispensation of grace. But in the tribulation period, once a man loses it, he can't get it back. Now, the question arises, well, how does a man lose his salvation in the tribulation period? Well, there's one real clear way. What is it? Mark of the beast. Take the mark. Well, no, how a man loses his salvation. Oh, how he loses it. Yeah, how he loses it. And that's it. He takes the mark of the beast. That's the one clear way. Yeah. He loses, he loses his salvation. He takes the mark of the beast. Yeah. You say, well, preacher, a man wouldn't take the mark of the beast if he was truly saved. I don't have time to get into all that, but it, they absolutely will. And let's see, what time is it? I, we may have time to get into it. Let me show you a few verses here. You ready? Look what it says in verse number... Um, verse. Go back to Hebrews chapter 6. We, we may get into this. Go back to Hebrews chapter 6. And look what it says in verse 6. If they shall fall away to renew them again into repentance, seeing they crucify to themselves the Son of God afresh, and put him to an open shame. For the earth which drinketh in the rain that cometh oft upon it, and bringeth forth herbs, meat for them by whom it is dressed, receiveth blessings, blessing from God. But, verse number 8 is the key, but that which beareth thorns and briars is rejected, and is nigh unto cursing, whose end is to be what? Burned. Burned. This is talking about the second advent. This is talking about people that are that are that are uh, burned up literally at the second advent and ultimately wind up in hell. The key there is that which is bare thorns and briars is rejected and is nigh unto cursing. Look with me, if you will, look with me, if you will, at Luke chapter eight. Look at Luke chapter eight. Look with me at Luke chapter 8. <clears throat> we have the parable of the sower, right? Parable of the sower. And there's, there's four types of ground. There's the wayside, there's the stony ground, there's the thorny ground, and then there's the good ground. Notice what Jesus says about in verse number... Um, <coughs> verse 13. They on the rock, the rocky ground, right, are they which when they hear receive the word with joy, and these have no root, which for a while believe, and in time of what? Temptation. Temptation fall away. What does the Bible call in Revelation 3.10? What does the Bible call the tribulation period? Great falling away. No, 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 that you're, 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 you're on the same path, but hold on. That's not, that's not Revelation 3.10. Revelation 3.10 calls the time of the tribulation period the time of what? Jacob's trouble. Nope, that's Jeremiah 30, verse 7. It's the time of temptation, which is to try them that dwell on the earth. The tribulation period is the time of temptation. So Jesus is given a parable here. He says those that are on the stony ground, they hear the word, they receive it, but the, they have no root. They go. They believe. They believe for a while, but then in time of temptation, fall away. Now take what Miss Heather said. Her answer. Second Thessalonians chapter two talks about a during the tribulation period. There's a great what falling away. That's not talking about the church age. Not talking about the church age. Oh yeah, there's apostasy happening in the church age. But here's what's going to happen. Right after the tribulation period, or excuse me, right after, excuse me, right after the rapture, right after the rapture, there's going to be a lot of people get saved, right? Because I mean, let me ask you a question: How many people know about the rapture of the church? A lot. They've made movies, Left Behind series, the books, the uh, the the new Left Behind movie that came out a couple of years ago with Nicolas Cage. They even have a movie. I've never seen it. I don't even know the name of it. I, I did know the name of it because I preached against it one time. But I can't even remember the name of it. It's literally a movie, a mockery movie about the rapture. Rapture Palooza, is that it? I have no idea. I, I honestly don't, don't know. I mean, I would say it. I'm not one of these guys like, I don't know all that stuff. No, if I knew the name of the movie, I'd say it. I honestly God, don't know the name of the movie. But it's, a, it's, it's got all these famous actors in it. And it's a movie mocking the rapture. All these people disappearing. 
People know about the rapture. People know that if there's a whole bunch of Christians that all of a sudden disappear, they're going to say, uh, yeah, that was the rapture. Now, the government is setting it up to where they're going to try to explain it away using what? Aliens. Aliens, UFOs. Absolutely. No doubt about it. But now, hold on a second. Right after the rapture, don't you think there's going to be a whole lot of people that realize what happened is going to get saved? Uh Yeah. There's going to be a lot of people. And the way you get saved in the tribulation period is you put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ and accept him as your Savior. But the problem is, is that's not all you got to do. You got to endure to the end, keep the commandments and all that kind of stuff, right? We've studied that. So at the midway point, at the, at the middle of the tribulation, the Antichrist is what? There's a what? An assassination attempt, right? The Bible says he's healed of his deadly wound. He comes back. And then he institute he he does he commits the abomination of desolation right where he goes into the temple and declares himself as God. At that point, he begins to demand that all people do what worship, worship him. And the way that you pledge your allegiance to him is you take the what mark. Mark. the mark of the beast. Without the mark of the beast, you can't do what yes. buy or sell. Buy or sell. And if you don't take the mark, you face the penalty of death. Let me ask you a question. Don't you think there's a whole lot of those saved people that are all of a sudden going to take the mark of the beast? Absolutely. And there you've got the great falling away. There you've got what Hebrews 6 is talking about. All these people that get deceived and blinded by the Antichrist, they take the mark and they fall away, and it's impossible to renew them again into repentance. And what does the Bible talk about those people being like? Thorns and briars. And at the end of the tribulation period, the Bible says that he gathers all that up, all the shaft, and burns it. And I'm not talking about me and you being able to lose our salvation in the church age because we went out and messed up. No, no, no. That's talking about tribulation saints. And see, when you explain it like that and you watch this now, you rightly divide the word of truth, it's amazing how the scriptures just kind of open up. See, all it takes is just a little bit of study. Now go back to Hebrews. We're almost done. Just three, four more minutes. We're done here. You ready? Hebrews chapter 6, verse number 9. But beloved, we are persuaded better things of you and things that accompany salvation, though we thus speak. The writer here, if you believe it's Apostle Paul, I do believe it's Apostle Paul. People have said, well, verse 9 makes it, makes it obvious that he's not talking about people losing their salvation. No, no, Paul is saying, I'm persuaded of better things of you and the things which accompany salvation, though we thus speak. Paul saying, I'm telling you what... Paul's not saying that it's impossible for those things to happen. Paul's saying it's possible for those things to happen, but I'm persuaded that you're not falling in that trap. See that thing there? Fundamentalists, fundamentalists have a wild way of trying to get out of what the Bible says. They'll take all this. It's kind of like these fundamentalists act like Paul's just writing this just for fun. Okay, let me give you a weird hypothetical, something that could never happen. Let me go into extreme detail and then just tell you, ah, but that can't happen, never mind. Stupid, man. So Paul's saying these things can happen, but I'm persuaded of better things of you. Okay? Um, so there you have it, folks. That, that's, that's the simple truth of the matter. A man cannot lose... And when they always... Now notice this. When a man's proving to you that you can lose your salvation, where does he always seem to take you? Hebrews. Hebrews. Acts. Acts, Matthew. Matthew, 2 Peter. Revelation. James. James. Isn't it interesting, folks? Have you ever noticed this? Isn't it interesting that they never seem to take you to the Pauline epistles to prove that you can lose your salvation? I, I'm going to be honest. I've never heard anybody try to argue out of the Pauline epistles that a man can lose his salvation. And the reason why is because it ain't in there. Amen. All right.